Welcome back to Retraced Echoes. As always, I'm your host. My name is Burton. Today, we're going to be stepping inside of a house that whispers tales from the past. It's a dwelling where the walls hold secrets may be as chilling as the very drafts that they harbor. Now, this house is located in the heart of Atchison, Kansas. It's known as the Sally House. And from the outside, it looks like a very unassuming house to the unknowing eye. But to those who listen closely, it murmurs tales of the supernatural. Its legacy of haunting begins not with gore and violence, but with the story of a young girl named Sally. Sally's tale begins on a very stormy night. Now, they would say that it was an acute appendicitis that forced her into the hands of the local doctor. In a desperate attempt to save her life, he began surgery right then and right there, right in the very front parlor of that very house. Now, you got to remember, it's a different day and age. Anesthetics was a luxury. It's not something that everyone could afford. Now, the way that the tale goes is that Sally's screams filled the room until her heart could no longer beat. Many will say that her spirit never really left the house. Her agony and confusion, it etched a permanent mark in that very house. Now, over the years, residents and visitors, they've all said the same thing, that there's unexplained phenomena Everything from toys moving on their own, to lights flickering on and off, to even hearing a child's laughter echoing in empty rooms. Some even speak of a more sinister encounter, like having burns or scratches that are inflicted by an unseen force, as if someone or something is still crying out for help, or perhaps for revenge. In today's episode, we dive deeper into the occurrences through the very eyes of those who have experienced them firsthand. Their stories, unfiltered and unsettling, it paints a picture of a home that holds more than just memories. When you have a house that's as haunted as supposedly what the Sally House is, you're going to catch the attention of some of the most predominant ghost hunters and supernatural explorers that this industry can muster. Now, each one of them kind of have a different approach, and you have to understand there's been countless YouTube channels and a plethora of television shows that have all walked the very rooms of the Sally House, all with camera in hand, trying to catch a glimpse of something otherworldly. I would say probably one of the most, let's go with popular, was the BuzzFeed Unsolved team. Now that was led by Ryan and Shane, who now have a spinoff channel called Watcher. Now with both of those series, BuzzFeed Unsolved, as well as Watcher, both of those shows have actually explored a Sally house. And I think probably some of the best ghost hunting that I personally saw. Now, if you're looking for more entertainment based, that's what some would call these channels. There's the daring duo of Sam and Colby. Now, they have kind of a high energy investigation style. Along the same lines was uh, Ghost Adventure. Now, that's the show that's led by Zach Baggins. A lot of people will say that he's more of the dramatic and intense style of investigations. Regardless of who went to that residence, they all had experiences And I think they're all worth a watch. When we look at the Sally House, it's captivated the curiosity of skeptics and believers alike. There's been many stories within the home, but I think probably the best story that was ever told was that of Deborah and Tony Pickman. Now, their experience in the home was during the early 1990s. It's probably what intensified the house's haunting to the level that it is today. It added a compelling layer of credibility to the claims of the paranormal activity that was occurring inside the house is probably also one of the best documented with the exception of maybe if you look at like the infield poltergeist. Deborah and Tony moved into the house, believe it or not, much like every other podcast we do, hoping for somewhat of a peaceful life in the new home. Now, little did they know they were stepping into a narrative already written by unseen hands. Their encounters, profound and disturbing, would soon captivate the attention of paranormal investigators as well as national media, making a significant chapter in the house's storied past. Deborah and Tony was looking for the perfect home, 
They had a growing family. In fact, it was the end of 1992 and they was preparing to welcome their very first child into the world. They found this house and they said, that one right there, that one looks perfect. Um, we moved in the end of 92. Um, our first boy was born in June of 93. So we were, we were pregnant and looking for, you know, a nice house when we moved in. And we just, we just kind of fell in love with the house. It was ideal, it was what we needed. Deborah saw potential within the walls, a sanctuary where laughter could fill the rooms and memories could be made. It was more than just a house. It was the setting of what they hoped would be the happiest years of their lives. Yeah, it was a lot bigger than the one we'd left and just seemed to, you know, when we first moved in, you know, it was pretty quiet. It, it seemed like just the, the right type of house for us, something we could grow into and raise the baby in. So The house with its quiet charm and spacious rooms offered the Pikmins a blank canvas for their dreams. But they would soon discover that some dreams are overshadowed by the nightmares that lurk in the unseen corners of our lives. As the winter thawed into spring, the Pikmin family settled into their new home, eager to start a new chapter, but as they would soon find out, some chapters, they take unexpected turns. We were happy to be there. Um, it was probably... A month or so. Yeah, after our son was born. No, oh, after we moved in, remember? Oh, that's right. Um, it was before he was born, and... <clears throat> We just little things, lights and, <clears throat> excuse me, lights and TVs going off and on, ceiling fans we had some trouble with, things that you could kind of rationalize at first, you know, until they started happening over and over and over. I mean, you might get up to go upstairs to the bedroom and have to turn the TV off five, six times in a row. In the quietest moments, the house seemed a whisper of activity. Lights flickering on and off, fans coming to life. Each incident, they were easily dismissed by rational minds as just mere quirks of an old house. So it got to the point to where we thought, boy, we either have a really bad electrical problem. And so we called our landlord and he had everything checked out and everything checked out okay. As the days turned into weeks, the strain of new parenthood was compounded not just by the sleepless nights, but by the unseen presence that began to assert itself and the perceived safety of their home, the Pikmin family found themselves touched by an unexplainable darkness that seemed to creep along the very edges of their lives. I think it was when your sister, her sister had come up, um, cause we weren't getting any sleep. We were, the baby was up all the time. But a lot of what was happening didn't happen while she was there. So we did get sleep, we did get caught up, and it was really nice. But it wasn't until the week she left, or I mean the, the last day that she left, that we realized what it was that we'd been dealing with. The very evening of her sister's departure was supposed to be somewhat of a little bit of fun, a little lighthearted enjoyment. It was gonna be a night of horror films and laughter, a brief escape, but the house, it had other plans, more sinister plans. I had gone up to take, I can't remember what, exactly what it was, but something for the baby back upstairs. And when I walked into the nursery, there was a few, there, I'm say three, four teddy bears kind of arranged in a circle, or stuffed animals arranged in a circle. And uh, I thought it was odd, because Deb, you know, knowing her, that she, um. She just didn't leave things laying around on the floor. And she, you know, it's put back in its place. So I just assumed that her and her sister had been up there with the baby playing. With every step that Tony took towards that nursery, the air grew thick, charged with silent whispers of the past. The circle of teddy bears? That had to be a chilling sight. Come down to ask them what they were playing, you know, upstairs, or why the teddy bears were arranged in such a manner. And they kind of looked at me clueless, like, well, we don't know what you're talking about. The family search for a logical explanation led them through the house. Doors and closets were flung open in a frantic search for an intruder who was never really there. A jokester who didn't exist. We all just went upstairs and 
here's these teddy bears sitting in a circle. Um, Wade actually thought maybe somebody would come into the house and mess. You know, we were looking in closet doors and everything, making sure, you know, none of our friends were over there playing a joke on us. And long story short, we put the teddy bears back. Um, we left the room. And as we were walking out, the light cl clicked back on. Um, when we turned back around, one of the teddy bears was back on the floor. And we would put it up on a shelf. Uh, <laughs> kind of freaked us out. So we put it back again. We went to the all, you know, we were all together to make sure nobody was doing it. Walked to the bottom of the stairs and we heard the click again and looked upstairs and the light had come back on. And when we went back up, sure enough, there's a teddy bear back on the floor. That night as the reality of their situation became very clear, the walls of the house seemed to close in. Each flicker of the light, each echo down the hallway, a reminder that they were not alone that something was lingering with them, and it was lingering just out of sight. Did the brave thing and gathered all our movies, the dog, everything we thought we'd need for the night. We all went in the Dev and I's bedroom and locked the door. <laughs> in the early hours of each morning, as the house lay silent, an eerie disturbance began to unsettle the newfound calm of the Pickman family. The walls of their home, once filled with joyful anticipation of new life, now echoed with the unexplainable sounds of an unseen intruder. We'd go to bed at night. We had several family photos up and down the stairs. Um, get up in the morning and the pictures would be turned upside down. <laughs> Painted upside down. Um, till one was finally broken, I think shattered. The family photos that lined the staircase every single morning would be found flipped upside down. Almost as though it was mocking their attempts at a peaceful life this point, you know, your brain tells you, you don't want to. I was still, I have to admit, a little skeptic myself. But we were in the kitchen, or not in the kitchen, in the living room, and we were kind of, in a, in a way, taunting it, I guess you'd say. My little brother said, all right, Sally, if you're here, uh, let us take your picture. And he was kind of facing the TV about that time, this teddy bear just kind of spun completely around, or a little stuffed animal bear by the TV right in front of us, and that we were like, <laughs> I remember he just said, I'm out of here, <laughs> and took all. As all of these things was occurring inside the household, the Pickmans wanted to understand why. Why was this going on inside their home? So, they began searching. They wanted to try to find the answers and led them to a source unlikely, but very promising. It was a psychic connected through a family friend. We had had, when the stuff happened after her sister got there, we um, got in contact with one of my older brothers who's very, very logical thinking, very, you know, level-headed person, and we wanted somebody else's opinion. And he came over to the house, and he had told us that his a boss that he had had a sister that was a psychic, um, and she was going to be in town, and had offered to get a hold of her and see if, you know, asked if we'd like her to come over and go through the house, and... And, you know, we, sure, you know, we'll try anything at this point. Tony and Deborah was desperate for any kind of insight. So what do they do? They invited the psychic into their very home, hoping that, if anything, they could provide some type of perspective of all the events that was turning their lives upside down. And she was the first one to come up with the name Sally. She had told us that she had seen a little girl there, um... The little girl's name was Sally. She was. It was communicated to her that this little girl ghost was seven years old. Her name was Sally. Um, some of the ailments that she had lived with in her life, um, you know, a couple different things, the things that she liked to play with in the house. And she basically told me that I needed to communicate with this spirit and tell her, no, you can't, you know, play with this or... Um, you can't wait the baby, you know, things like that. Kind of treat her as if she were right there. Armed with this new knowledge, Tony and Deborah were advised to interact with Sally as though she was there, as though she was visible within the household. Now, this guidance, it was not just about coexisting with Sally, but also setting boundaries. Boundaries within the home, boundaries within the family, boundaries within the having the baby inside the household. Yeah, you know, talking to the air was going to be a new kind of <laughs> endeavor. 
The psychic's visit brought more than just a name. It offered a method of how to manage the haunting. And during her time there, she experienced a very profound connection with all the energies that was there. Now that somewhat validated for the Pikmins their experiences. It was definitely enlightening. There was a, a point where we had gone upstairs and to the nursery and she felt, you know, like a real heaviness. She started holding her chest and breathing real heavy and she told us she more or less said we need to get out of here there's too too many in here she doesn't like us in here right now and i was holding a camera at this time and we started leaving the room and she had told me to take a uh, she said she's right there told me to take a photograph well when i i turn around i'm not seeing anything but i went ahead and took a photograph but something did show up in the photograph so was kind of like a murky streak of a blob kind of going up the stairs. It's It's been seen online a lot. There was one coming out of the room and then one as we're standing at the bottom of the stairs. With all the things that was happening within the Sally house, there were certain things that would blend the past with the present. Twice I can figure up the top of my head upstairs, I would see this woman dressed in 18th century clothing but it would be Devra. I would see her dress like that. Well, uh, I'd be in the back and I'd see her walk past the doorway. Um, I'd go out to find her, go into the room it walked into, nothing. I'd go around the corner and there's Deb completely, you know, not in that outfit, you know, <laughs> her hair all down, uh, you know, just completely white. She'd just gotten out of shower herself. These visions seemingly stepped right out of history suggests that maybe the haunting was not merely the house or even the land, but perhaps it was intertwined with the very fabric of time itself. As all of our stories always do, it didn't stop there. Now objects began to move, and sometimes very aggressively, as if propelled by invisible hands. One evening, there was a small potpourri dish. It was thrown right towards the air, just barely missing one of their friends ended up hitting an old stucco wall and it was with enough force to leave a dent. During a quiet evening, as Tony's mother cradled the infant, a sudden chill came into the room. The tranquility was shattered when an unseen force seemed to pinch the baby, provoking a cry of distress from the innocent child. In a protective outburst fueled by a grandmother's instinct, she confronted the invisible assailant. Her voice echoing through the house, a defiant plea laced with desperation. I'd actually seen, the, saw the oil lamp lift up one time, probably a good foot in the air, and go towards my mother like someone was, you know, she was holding the baby, and she f said she, the baby reacted like something pinched him, and you know, it kind of upset her, so she yelled, "Damn it, leave this baby alone!" And this oil lamp just flew off the table towards her and before I hit her it just stopped in midair and dropped um, and that was because I screamed I think now as that oil lamp was thrown into the air it was almost like a hand reached up and grabbed it and then dropped it right in front of them now obviously with all the things that was going on the Pikmins they had no doubt that their home was now the domain of a presence that defied any type of explanation now with all of this going on occasionally Things would become quiet within the very house, but it was a very deceptive quiet. There were times when things would seem a little calmer. I mean, you, you would go weeks without anything happening, so you're thinking, okay, it's actually working a little bit. As the occurrences escalated, the nature of these events began to sow doubts and fears within the Pikmin family. In fact, just spontaneously, fires began to ignite, and it was targeting different objects within the house, and it began to do it on a very regular basis. Yeah, and then it escalated to the point where we didn't know what we were talking to, because it wasn't like a little girl was doing the things that were... There were times when things would seem a little calmer. I mean, you, you would go weeks without anything happening, so you're thinking, okay, it's actually working a little bit. Now, with all of this going on, Tony and Deborah, they began to struggle and reconcile the thoughts that this was just a harmless little child of Sally. If anything, it felt more like it was a malevolent force that seemed to thrive on chaos and fear. Their home became plagued 
with different types of paranormal phenomena. Now, the most alarming of all of it was obviously the fires that kept igniting. I think that would scare just about anybody. And there was no discernible pattern. It's not like they knew, okay, a fire was going to start on this date and this time with this object. It was kind of all over the place. Normally, it was, uh, it, we had the teddy bear by the TV a couple times. Um, royal lamp were just uncontrollably get really the the fire would just off you know different candles we had tapir candles and sconces on the wall the tony didn't notice until you know one day probably well after they had been lit up and like tea lights you know a little tangle tea lights now each incident was a reminder of the unseen dangers that lurked within their very walls objects that once symbolized comfort they were transformed into potential hazards by an unseen force. I was always in fear. I'm thinking if it's lighting this fires, what's to keep it from setting us on fire or, you know, and the biggest concern was our Vaden. As the threats within the house began to escalate, the Pikmins found themselves caught between the desire to understand the unknown and the urgent need to protect their family. The unseen force manifesting in their home, it began to leave marks on Tony's body. Can if there there were times when I didn't feel anything. They would literally, someone would literally have to point it out to me because I had no idea. But there were times when, and it happened so much that I got to where I knew it was happening. Um, it would be an intense cold, and the closest way I could figure it, it would feel like almost like an icicle going through you. You know, not that I'd had an icicle go through me, but it was that cold, just a really intense cold feeling that would shoot through you. And usually when I felt that, I'd almost 90% of the time I knew, you know, I was being scratched. Now, Tony's encounter with these chilling touches, they were not merely sensations. They were precursors to things that we could physically see after the fact. There was probably five or six times when I got a scratch where it actually at times felt like a, a bad bee sting. Um, and then probably about three times it felt like someone really punched the hell out of me it uh i remember one time being interviewed by a, um i think it was sightings and i was holding the baby standing in the doorway of the kitchen and it just felt like somebody chimney punched me as hard as i could and i almost dropped the baby i screamed out and i was like oh and kind of my knees you know buckled now, the physical assaults were not just terrifying in their intensity, but also in their implications. With each unexplained injury, the reality of their situation, it became more dire. The scratches was ranging from anything from crosses to X's. How scary would that be? Now, with everything that was going on and the fact that it was becoming more and more violent, it made the family think that this probably is not a little girl. It was probably something significantly darker. Tony and Deborah found themselves grappling not only with the paranormal, but also with each other's perceptions of the unexplained events. Scared the hell out of me. I, all I could think of was, you know, I'm, this is the exercise, erectus type stuff. I'm physically being scratched and, and, you know, what's next? It, and I fought with it you know, trying to understand why she didn't see. I, I mean, I know now, but that then it was, it was really confusing. Now let's imagine being Tony for just a minute. He's got all these things going on. He's getting scratched. He's getting abused within his household. It had to be taken some type of a mental toll on him. Then you've got Deborah. She's dealing with some skepticism. And on top of that, she's got that maternal instinct where she's like, this is just a little girl. We need to protect the little girl. If there is something malevolent, we want to try to help this little girl. Now, Deborah's rational approach, it was influenced by what she was doing daily, being a mom, which kind of like what we were just talking about, it kind of helped with the idea of having a childlike spirit inside the house. Now, this, it clashed starkly with what Tony was dealing with. It's truly hard to understand exactly what was going on with Deborah and Tony and this spirit and 
what her thought process obviously was, and I'm sure it probably wouldn't make sense to us on the outside looking in. Deborah was an ever nurturing mother, and she tried to create somewhat of a warm, inclusive atmosphere, even for the spirit that she believed to be Sally. But I want you to hear, and again, we talk about how these entities kind of ingrain themselves into their lives. I want you to hear some of the things of what she was doing. Which, if you think about the the end result, you know, that, that what we were dealing with was evil. Um, it, it, it had me, it, I welcomed it in an and really easily, really quickly because of that motherly instinct of taking care of and oh, you poor little, you know, what's easier to close someone in other than, you know, an innocent little girl. There were times where I was sitting with the baby and come on, let's go uh, read a book. And then I would invite Sally to come sit with us and you know I'd sit down on the floor Indian style and baby I'm one me and I would feel a distinct coldness on the other knee and you significant like 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 my me was stuck in a freezer or something I mean badly stained this cold was not merely a draft it was a piercing chill as if ice had replaced the air right beside her Deborah's experiences upstairs it was not uncommon in just her everyday life either. Tony too was no stranger to these unsettling experiences. If anything, the sounds of nocturnal activity that they initially dismissed as just, you know, the settling of a house or whatever, it began to reveal a more haunting origin. We, Wade would hear a lot of times when we'd go to bed at night, you would, you would hear something running up and down the steps. Um, to the point, you know, we had a few cats, and I would always, I'd be cussing the cats all the time, scare them so they quit doing it. And as I got to the top of the stairs, I, I literally heard a little girl giggling, and I felt that cold that she's feeling just rush by me, and and almost, I, I swear to God, it moved my hair. I mean, you could feel it that much. How crazy would that be? This encounter at the staircase where Tony's just trying to scare these cats, it turned into a direct encounter with an unseen entity and one that I can only assume probably scared Tony to death. It would scare me to death. The sound of the giggling, that's probably like my biggest fear if I ever went on one of these ghost hunts. Something about hearing a child that's not there freaks me out. I think this was probably a turning point for both Tony and Deborah to, to where now they're going, my house is haunted. And on top of that, it's capable of manifesting physically and emotionally. Now, for many that find themselves caught in the grip of a haunting, I feel like this question comes up quite a bit. Why wouldn't you just simply leave? Well, for Tony and Deborah, much like the other stories, it seems like it's always a common denominator, which also falls into my line and my thought process on demonic oppression and depression, which we might get to in this story. The answers are woven in the very fabric of their current lives. They have financial constraints. Now this, they just had a brand new baby. It kind of anchored them to the Sally house. They didn't have a chance. All of their funds had been invested in making this house a home. And it left them I believe zero money to just pick up and leave. Now on top of that, there would be periods where everything would just kind of calm down. It kind of gave them a false sense of security. Sometimes it'd be weeks or months in between activities and this intermittent peace, it was, if anything, creating doubts in their own minds. And, and like I said, there were times when you, you could go weeks to a month without anything happening and you start to think, okay, you know, it's gone now. We don't have to worry about it anymore. And then out of the blue, it, it would just come back. And it seemed like every time it would happen again, it was twofold. I mean, it came back twice as hard. As the hauntings intensified, 
So did the emotional and psychological toll on Tony and Deborah. Now, what began as somewhat of an external, I'll call it a tear, it seeped into their everyday household, manifesting in ways that they would probably never be able to anticipate. In fact, Tony had always been a very loving husband, and he began to have very dark, intrusive thoughts that was very deeply, we're going to say troubling. His emotions began to kind of turn sour. He often found himself angry and annoyed with Deborah. It was as if the malevolent force within their home was not just content with the physical disturbances, but was intent on tearing apart the two of them and the emotional bond that they had as well. Now, as we typically talk about in these podcasts, I feel like it happens every single time. And it's something that I feel like families who are going through a haunting kind of have to be aware of. It was taking a major toll on Deborah and Tony. Arguments became very frequent. It was almost like whatever this was, was trying to erode their relationship. And for good reason, there was an episode that I did based out of Florida. It was the man's family haunting. And you're going to see a similarity between that and this here in just a very quick second. There was a breaking point that came somewhat unexpectedly. Tony woke up one day with thoughts so dark that they kind of shook him to the core. I had one day woke up and literally all I could think of was planning on hurting her when she came home. I, I had went as far as I had a knife setting out. I, I planned on, you know, killing me. Yeah. Um, and it was that morning. I remember coming out of the bedroom in the morning and something hit me from behind. It's like come up and just, I don't know if it went into me or well, that it come in, just strike through my back and with enough force to throw me forward. And into the railing and sphere. I think it not got to reef runs of the railing. In the face of such darkness, sometimes it takes a moment of sheer terror to prompt a desperate but necessary change. For Tony and Deborah, that day marked the beginning of the end of their ordeal at the Sally House. They had finally decided to reclaim their lives from the shadows that had overrun their home. Now leaving the Sally House behind, Tony and Deborah. They hoped to close the chapter on their terrifying experience. However, the peace that they sought was short-lived, as the haunting proved not to be confined to the walls of their former home. Yeah, her, her brother had come up for a visit, and it was the first time I'd met her brother and, and his wife, and um, and we were sitting down to dinner that night, and I, you know, that cold I had told you about, I started feeling that all around my stomach, and I thought, oh no. So I kind of excused myself and called Devin to the little, we had a little room off the kitchen and I said, I'm feeling that cold again, but I was scared to say anything for a brother. I didn't know how he would react and he had fit and being the first time I'd met him, but him when I feel ruined his perception of me. Um, so Dan had me left my shirt. Sure enough, I had, that's where I'd have to let, I had like 11 scratches across my stomach. Um, totally freaked me out because to this point I'm still under the impression that if a house was haunted it was the house that was haunted um it stayed at the house once you left you were good to go Tony's encounter during what should have been a simple family gathering was a reminder of the tear of what he faced in that other home what a scary thing to have happen you think you're away from whatever it is you feel like now you can breathe. You didn't have anything for the, the bulk of your life. You moved to this house and now you're undergoing all these things. And now there's this personal attachment also that you just can't get rid of. What a very scary thing for Tony to have to deal with. And I guess Deborah inadvertently. I read in the research that that's not the only experiences that he had. And the truth, true belief was that 
He was going to endure it for the rest of his life in some capacity. As we close this chapter on their lives, we're somewhat reminded that the world holds mysteries that are vast and at times deeply personal. Tony and Deborah, they continue to navigate their lives with a newfound awareness, a readiness for whatever whispers may come from the very shadows. Now their journey, it doesn't just serve as a tale of survival, but as a beacon for all who face their own unseen battles. I hope, if anything, their story inspires those who maybe hear it to look beyond whatever the darkness is in their lives and find the strength to light their own way forward. Because if you think about it in the end, it's not just about the haunted places, but about the human spirit's capability to endure and hope even when faced with the unexplainable. Now, if you enjoy this podcast, I would ask you to join along wherever you're listening to your podcast. Give this one a like if you're on the YouTube machine. Also, comment down below. How scary of a situation would this be? Also, depending on where you listen to your podcast, you might want to check out the YouTube. Sometimes we put different things on there that you might find somewhat interesting. Now, in addition to this, I also want to mention that thanks to good old Nick, on our website, we now have a section where you can submit your own story, or maybe there's a story that you want to hear. If you know of a family haunting or something of that equivalent, you can go there. You can send me a little message. I'll get it and we'll get it in the lineup. Also, speaking of Nick, if you enjoyed this podcast, it comes out every single Wednesday, every single week. You might like another podcast that I'm a co-host on called Deceptive Reality. Now, I do that with Nick that I mentioned before, and that comes out every single Friday. It's a different unsolved mystery from around the entire globe. We kind of do a deep dive. Only one person a week knows what the subject is, and then the other person kind of hears the story if they don't know what that story is. It's kind of an interesting way of looking at it. Well... Again, I want to thank everyone for being here. I appreciate the fact that you spent this little bit of time with me. And until I see you in the next podcast, goodbye.